Hi, folks who are joining us. We want to give just a couple of minutes um, to let people log on before we get started. So uh, give us just a couple of minutes, and then um, we'll jump right in. All right, well, for folks who are running late, they'll just have to have to catch up. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for tuning in today um, and taking the time to join us for what we hope will be both an inspiring and interactive workshop as part of the DevEx Youth Will Digital Rally. Our focus will be on leadership, um, and this is sort of an unofficial kickoff for next week's campaign theme, theme about how youth will lead tomorrow. We encourage you all to continue to engage in the conversation well beyond this initial discussion. Um, my name is Jennifer Gottesfeld. I'm currently the Senior U.S. Program Manager at Global Health Corps. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our organization, our mission is to mobilize a global community of emerging leaders to build the movement for health equity. And we all share the common belief that health is a human right. Um, we uh, do a year-long fellowship, and it kicks off with a two-week training institute that we hold at Yale in conjunction with the Yale Global Health Leadership Institute. And it's designed to prepare young professionals for a one-year global health fellowship. Um, we have fellowships both in the United States uh, addressing domestic health issues, as well as internationally in Eastern and Southern Africa. I myself was a fellow in 2011-2012 um, with Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative in Malawi. And so I've had the opportunity to um, participate in both in training both as a fellow and uh, in facilitating the training for the past five years now. Um, our leadership development framework engages Global Health Corps fellows in discussions, case studies, and lecture sessions um, with both fellows, fellow peers, as well as global leaders including Still Harbor, who has been an incredible partner to us since 2009. And we're thrilled that they've joined us here today to provide you all with a taste of the guided journaling and reflection that is really a key component to developing leaders for social change and something um, that we provide our fellows with not only throughout the two-week training institute, but um, Still Harbor trainings throughout the entire fellowship year and then well on into um, the post-fellowship experience. Uh, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce a GHC alum, Jordan McGinn, who is currently working with One Acre Fund in Kenya. She's joined us live today to answer your questions, but we've actually captured her story on video uh, to make sure that it's not interrupted since sometimes um, international streaming can be spotty. So um, if you have any questions during this presentation, feel free to use the chat function to direct questions to our presenters. Uh, myself included, so that we can address them at the end of the presentation. So I want to thank you again for joining us, and now I will turn it over to Jordan. Hello from Kenya. I did my undergraduate degree in communications. I was always kind of fascinated by the way that language helped us understand, construct, and in a lot of ways, reflected reality. And that's why I found it so ironic that in my first year working in development, it was the language that I lacked most. 
I began my career in development working in West Africa. I worked with a vocational training center that helped improve kind of the livelihoods of the rural poor. I then transitioned and became a Global Health Corps fellow and began focusing on sexual and reproductive health in Uganda. And throughout this experience, I always kind of had a hard time explaining to people what exactly it was I was doing, and more importantly, why I was doing it. And not only did I have a hard time explaining what I was trying to do, but I also had a difficult time explaining what it was that health workers, that mothers, that the leaders in the community I worked in were trying to do. And as I went through this discernment process, which I'm sure you'll hear Perry talk about, I, I kind of continued to look for the language to explain this in a way that kind of captured the nuances of development that I myself was experiencing. And in this process, I came across this term, positive disruption. I don't know who originally coined the term, but it was popularized by Melinda Gates in one of her TED Talks. And this term, it immediately stuck because it in so many ways encapsulated exactly what I, as a development practitioner, was trying to do. But also what the mothers, what the leaders, what the health workers, we're trying to do. We're all trying to create positive disruption in some form or another. And as Melinda points out, I think that disruption is often thought of as something unwelcome. It's chaotic, it's unsettling. We as a society, we intentionally avoid disruption. But positive disruption is important and sometimes even vital to catalyze change. It exposes new possibilities, it ignites new conversations, and it challenges our old assumptions. Disruption is key to moving us forward, to showing us what could be and not just what is. This term has stuck with me over the years. Um, I now work in Western Kenya for an agricultural organization. And we provide seeds and fertilizer on credit to smallholder farmers, along with training, delivery of these products, and market access. And I absolutely love my job, and I firmly believe that we're having incredible impact. But the thing that excites me most about my job actually has nothing to do with farmers. It has to do with women. About a year ago, um, a woman named Pauline Wimjala and I, um, Pauline is kind of known as my partner in crime. She's one of our field leaders, has kind of risen from the bottom of the organization to now be one of the leaders. And her and I started an organization or an institution within our organization called the Women's Leadership Council. And this council was aimed with creating a workplace where all could succeed. We were seeing that women were not at the top levels of the organization being represented. They were being promoted at much lower rates. And they were really struggling with ways to balance kind of their home life and their work life. And so we saw this council as something really necessary to help support these women. So we started this council, as I said, about a year ago. And in that time, we've, we've made a lot of kind of small changes, one step at a time. We started by kind of reviewing our maternity leave policy and making sure people understood it so that women weren't being denied maternity leave. Um, when they needed to go for bed rest. We also worked with our HR department on improving our sexual harassment procedures. We helped to ensure that people, when they reported, knew that it was a safe and safe um, space for them to do so, and that we improved the processes and people's knowledge so that they could understand we wanted a sexual harassment-free workplace. We also did a number of other things. We developed a women's leadership training curriculum that helped train our female staff on issues that were gender specific, like balancing home and work life. And kind of throughout all this process, we realized that what we were doing was actually oftentimes unwelcome. It was disruptive. It was chaotic. When you give women a safe space for the first time to air their concerns and say what they're going through, it is chaotic. And when you talk about sexual harassment, it is unwelcome. But now, a year after we launched this council, 50% of our most recent promotions to our field leadership team have been women. 
We now have the highest representation of women in the organization's history at leadership levels. And Pauline herself, the woman I talked about who's my partner in crime, became our first ever member of our senior field leadership team. And we did this. We did this because we were willing to cause disruption, to cause positive disruption. Because we were willing to ask why. Why can women not make up top leaders in the organization? And to challenge the status quo. Why can't women balance home life and work life and still succeed in their careers? We did this by causing disruption, by doing things that were unwelcome and unsettling and uncomfortable, but continuing to expose potential and opportunities that we might have never otherwise seen. And I think kind of what I learned, myself being a young professional, is that we as young professionals are actually in the greatest position to catalyze these change. When you start your career, you're told you need to learn the ropes, you need to learn how things are done, you need to learn how things work. And we're told that that's our greatest deficit. But I would argue that that's our greatest asset. Because the truth of the matter is, is the way that things have worked simply isn't working. If it was working, mothers would not be dying in childbirth. Health facilities would not run out of life-saving medicine. And people like Pauline would not be the exception to the rule. They would be the norm. But the truth of the matter is, is the way that things have always worked simply doesn't work. It's not good enough. It's failed mothers. It's failed the poor. And it's failed each one of us. And so the fact that we don't know how things should work gives us a very unique opportunity to ask why. Why can't facilities get these medicines? Why are there food deserts in some of the wealthiest cities? Why don't women get the education that men get? Why not? Why can't it be done? Why can't we do it? And we have a chance to push the envelope, to ask why, and to challenge the status quo. We have a unique opportunity as young professionals to create positive disruption. And so if I urge you to do nothing else today, I urge you as you go forth to ask why, to be willing to make small disruptions. And it can feel kind of overwhelming to be tasked with the burden of causing positive disruption. I think some of us, you know, myself included, we lack the language to explain the kind of change we want to see. But what I've discovered is that there's other people out there who have the exact words to describe the worlds we envision. And it's a matter of us amplifying their voice and adding to the chorus and continuing to ask why. And I think that if we all come together and we commit to creating this disruption, we can potentially reshape what the future of global health and global development looks like. We can change it. We can change the path, one small disruption at a time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. You can obviously why we are so proud of our fellows and alumni. Uh, they continue to promote positive disruption in the organizations that they serve in and push the limit of possibility to really impact social change. The discernment process that Jordan talks about is a key component of structuring how we address some of these big why questions. Our partner, Still Harbor, believes the world urgently needs more individuals and organizations who deeply understand their roles, however humble, in making the world a better place. It's important to stress that this cannot be accomplished by intellectual or professional training alone. Developing your interior life and spiritual awareness through a deep understanding of self, a healthy orientation to others, and a full appreciation of our human existence requires an ongoing commitment to spiritual formation. We are absolutely thrilled to have Perry Dougherty here with us to walk through, to help walk participants through an abbreviated reflection process similar to the one that we do with our fellows. Perry is the director of the Institute for Spiritual Formation and Society at Still Harbor 
She has a background in corporate training and development, as well as nonprofit development, communications, and management with social justice organizations. Um, be sure to include any questions that you have for Jordan and Perry in the comments section, as we'll be delving right into the Q&A immediately following Perry's presentation. And now here's Perry. The biggest question, the biggest why question for many of us, and it often goes really under the surface, is why am I here? Uh, why are you here? What are you meant to do with this one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver says in her, in her poem, The Summer Day? I love working with people um, who have committed to or embraced ideas of social justice or social change because often they've begun that journey by asking why. Why is there inequality? Why is there not peace? Why is there pain and suffering? Asking why of ourselves or of the world or of others requires us to simultaneously take responsibility for listening and engaging the insight or the responses that come, and to surrender control. That when we ask why honestly, we're open to anything that will come. And so when we ask why we're here, why I'm here, why you're here, why, why this life, why now, what we're really getting to is a sense of openness to the world, openness to the possibility of ourselves. And that's really powerful. I think that this, this simultaneous responsibility and surrender in the past captured quote by by the poet real questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday, far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. And so this question for me of what is my vision for change, why am I here, what is my purpose, how can I lead, is grounded in this idea of asking the questions so that you may love and live them and eventually live your way into the answer. Not so that you answer them today and then rigidly define yourself by that response. And this is the paradox of taking responsibility for what you notice, for what you learn, for what you hear, and surrendering that you do not know it all today. And that is powerful. To me, that is the secret of leadership for social change. So often what we do in uh, Still Harbor sessions um, is engage in some guided journaling or re quiet reflection or small group discussion. And around this theme of vision, there are three core questions that I like to have people engage in guided journaling um, so that they can tap into uh, a deeper sense of why you are here, why they are here. And um, the questions are, what do you believe about life and why? What do you value about life and why? And how do you wish to engage with life and why? And these questions, I encourage you now to take a few moments with them and just free write. Just ask yourself these questions and see what emerges. And notice, notice what happens as you just let it flow for each of these questions.
as you're ready, you can wrap up and finish your thoughts. And certainly, this is a very abbreviated reflection time for such big questions. And I encourage you to take them with you into journaling practice and reflective practice that you may have in, your, in the rest of your life. But really, what I'm trying to point to is that the why of your existence, that deep question of who you are and why you're here, is linked to these things that we, that are beliefs, that are values, that are experiences, that are how we hope to act and behave in the world. They're all linked. And the more that we can bring these things into alignment so that the, the who we are, the why we're here is reflected in our beliefs, in our values, in our engagement, in our action, in our choices. The more those things align, the more whole we become and the more authentic we become as leaders. So I do this mini reflection to get you thinking about what is your vision for your life, for your service, for the world, and how to dare to really believe in a vision that is transcendent and bigger than you. It's not easy. It's possible. Thank you so much, Carrie. We hope that our presenters have inspired many of you to start asking some of these questions, reflecting on how you will lead tomorrow. We'll now spend the remainder of this time answering your questions. Um, you can use this time for personal reflection, and um, we encourage you, whether you're doing that now or later, to really ponder how you can have a positive impact on the world around you. So please take this time to send us any questions you have. Um, you can post them in the comment section. You can tweet them at us. Uh, and we're excited to uh, engage with you. And remember that if you're tweeting, use the hashtag YouthWill. So we're excited to hear, um, to hear your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we have one question that came in before the presentation. I think this is probably one that both you and Jordan can field. The question uh, comes from Oliver Ho, and the question is, how do you strike a balance between ensuring the material comforts for ex expat staff to reduce turnover and the risk of maintaining or creating too much distance from the local staff and the community in which they work? So. One uh, integral piece of the Global Health Corps program is actually the co-fellow model, where we place a, um, an international fellow, uh, often someone from the United States, with an international fellow who is from, from the country that uh, they're working in. So for instance, myself, um, I was in Malawi, and I had a co-fellow who was Malawian. And, um, that was able to help me sort of more deeply root in the culture and the society and the social norms than I otherwise would have if I had just come as an expat um, on my own to work within an institution, even if I was working with uh, colleagues from that country. I feel like having this, um, this person who is like your other half throughout the year who can help you navigate some of these questions, who can be a thought partner, really changes the way that you're able to interact and more quickly assimilate. Um, I think generally on, on the side of sort of material comforts for expats, it's setting an expectation and an understanding early that, um, that part of this uh, work that we're doing requires um, being present, and part of being present is also assimilating with the community that you're living in. And so, um, you know, while we appreciate that people are coming from a lot of different places with a lot of different um, expectations about how they, uh, they want to be living, there's also the reality of the place where they're at. And so, as part of the uh, trainings that we do, both at the beginning of the year at Yale as well as throughout the, um, the course of the fellowship, we really talk about resiliency, um, about recognizing your own needs and self-care, but also balancing that with where you are and um, and what the community is around you. And so um, really thinking deeply about some of those things uh, is important to in order to be resilient and continue uh, to do good work throughout the year and throughout the rest of all of our careers. 
I don't know if you have anything else to include, Jordan. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm calling from Kenya, and the power is out, so bear with me a little bit. I'm quite dark here, um, and hopefully the internet stays with us. But yeah, I think that this is actually an excellent question and something that I personally and I know a lot of the people who work in development struggle with. Um, for me, it's about balance. I think that um, either way, kind of one direction or the other, can be challenging, and it's about finding a middle ground that's right for you. Um, and I think that boils down to intention and asking yourself kind of why are you here, what are you doing, what you're doing, um, and what is your objective in being a development practitioner and in working in global health, especially when doing so abroad. Um, and I think we forget over time. We get caught up in the work and the deliverables and the impact and the evaluation and the monitoring, and we forget the original intention, like Perry was talking about, of why we're here and what we believe in and kind of what our fundamental values are. And so I think doing continual exercises to bring yourself back to the point of your intention and, and to asking yourself and kind of challenging yourself on a regular basis, am I leading a life that reflects my values? And I think, you know, if you came abroad to engage and to learn and to be outside your comfort zone and you choose to lead a life totally within your comfort zone, you know, the material goods and the social network, all of which is very same to your home country, are you really being true to yourself and to why you chose to come here and work in this field in the first place? Um, and so I think it's about coming in to working in development and working internationally with an intention, checking back on that regularly, and making sure that your actions, big or small, kind of reflect that. And I think it's easy to fall into this trap of kind of your nine to five, and at work you're talking about empowerment and you're talking about you know, bringing people up and capacity development. And then in your daily interactions, when you walk by someone or the people you choose to socialize with, um, you're dismissive or you're kind of not respective of kind of their own inner power and their humanity. That, in my mind, is kind of the dangerous side of working internationally. Um, so I think if you can strike that balance um, and you can find a place where you're comfortable with and where your lifestyle and your work are both reflective of your values and your intentions, then that's what's right for you. I think Perry um, has done, I know Still Harbor was a really important part of me kind of coming to this realization, and I would love to hear what Perry thinks on this. Thanks, thanks, Jordan. Um, I, I'll just echo what um, Jen and Jordan have said here. I think that it is a question of what are your values, and I think what, what happens sometimes is we have to make compromises on our values. That said, I, I don't think that this work requires everyone to be martyrs, and I think that the, the work of social change and development, if the goal is to get everyone's basic needs met, then we don't want to be sacrificing ourselves. So really, for me, it becomes a question of how do you discern the middle path between where recognizing where you are and recognizing that there is some compromise, perhaps, on material goods and, and needs that you've grown accustomed to because of uh, growing up in perhaps more privilege than where, where you're serving. Um, so recognizing that, that there may be some compromise there on some of the comforts, but also honoring the fact that if, if your basic needs aren't being met, then it's going to be difficult to, to help other people meet their basic needs. So I think there's a middle path, and I think coming back to this question of what do I value and why, and how do I want to engage with the world, with communities that I'm serving, and why, and really getting very clear on that, not just one time, not just before you engage in the service, but at every step along the way. And then the last thing I'll add is this is a question for individuals, but it's also a question for organizations. And sometimes we join systems that have made decisions on this. We join organizations or structures that have already made an assessment of of what is, is being offered to staff or volunteers. And I think as individuals, we have to work with understanding why those decisions were made and asking of the systems, why are you making these decisions, if they feel like they're not aligned with our individual values. And, th and that's, that's a bit what Jordan pointed to in asking, why are women not being promoted on the same level? You know, if, if you arrive somewhere and all the expat volunteers have one kind of housing 
and all of the local staff have a very different quality of housing, asking why that is of the organization gently, appropriately, kindly, may be an important learning point for you and, and for the people you're working with. Thank you so much, Perry, uh, and Jordan, and Jen. Those were all really great responses, and they've given us a lot to reflect on. Um, Perry, in terms of, and, and actually of all of you, uh, you gave us a very brief framework of questions that we can start asking to delve a little bit deeper into the reasons why we might want to go into social justice work. I'd be interested to hear uh, both from Jen and from Jordan, uh, who have gone through this um, more extensive training with you, how long the initial process took for them and how long it took for them to get to uh, um, an appropriate level of understanding in their own eyes and maybe what their ongoing process might have looked like. Uh, Jen or Jordan, do either of you want to take this one on? Sure, um, I can start. It's been an ongoing process for me to this day. Um, what I realize now, reflecting on um, on sort of the the initial training um, that I went through in 2011 with Stoll Harbor, um, and and looking back on sort of all of my experiences throughout the years, is I'm so grateful that I can recognize the thought process that's going on in my head. Um, in some of that discernment and reflection and having it not be subconscious but something that I'm actually actively thinking about and seeking uh, to think about on a regular basis. Um, but that, that has taken years of intentionality and practice. Um, obviously you can start it, but like any practice it takes a long time and it takes a lot of focus in order to really um, hone those abilities. Um, I think for me, at the beginning, it took a couple of months to get comfortable with. Um, like, like some of our fellows, uh, when I initially went through this training, words like spirituality were really hard for me because I didn't necessarily consider myself a spiritual person um, and often linked that with religion. And it was really wonderful and freeing for me to recognize that those two things are not um, mutually exclusive. And I was able to find a place within myself um, where I could really explore a lot of that interior formation in a way that I hadn't been comfortable with before. And that has been one of the biggest pieces of my personal and professional growth um, throughout, throughout these years since then, is really being able to, to dig through those things and, and begin to have an understanding of myself and how I fit into the larger picture of, um, of the world and what I want to do and what I feel like I'm capable of doing. Um, so I hope that that sort of answers uh, the question of the process. Um, but it really comes down to intentionality and recognizing once you hear that these are things um, that will help you to, to integrate it into your life in a real way. Um, and, and that is the beginning point of this journey that's so important. Jordan, do you have anything that you can add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I completely agree kind of with what Jen has said in that I wish I could give you wisdom on this, but it's um, something that you kind of go through continually. There's no start date and end date and no time frame in which you've discerned enough and figured it all out. Um, and so I think for me, um, acknowledging that in and of itself was very important. Um, but I think another thing that the Still Harbor process and a lot of this discernment allowed me and kind of my colleagues to do was to have a shared language in which we talked about our experience and to be able to kind of express it, you know, spirituality, be that the language you would or wouldn't use, at least you're speaking kind of the same language with peers who are experiencing kind of similar challenges um, and similar revelations in the process. And I think that that has continued to be a really integral and important part of how I understand my experience, my engagement with others. Um, I think the second thing is that um, resiliency when working in development is incredibly important um, and I think uh, an ability to be intentional and to be discerning and um, to be reflective allows you to understand your experiences in a way that's kind of empowering as opposed to something that um, can be debilitating and I think when you see so much suffering like 
Perry was talking about. Um, it can be immobilizing in a lot of ways, and an ability to understand that on an emotional, intellectual level um, is kind of very important to making sure that you can handle that in a productive way and continue to make an impact um, while still being empathetic. Um, so I think that that has, that doesn't really answer your question, I'm realizing, but I, I do think that it's just, it, it's still taking me time. I'm still struggling, but I'm doing it in a way that hopefully allows me to continue to be a productive and contributing member of kind of the global health movement. And then, Perry, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything in terms of your experience on, on what this process should t uh, take for individuals or if it's completely unique or if we should move on to the next question. Yeah, I'm happy to add briefly. Um, I think that, you know, a couple of things. We, we talk about spiritual formation or spiritual practice. Um, it really, it's about looking inward and then figuring out how that connects outward for us. That's that's the that's the broadest definition that we've encompassed, and that holds um, people's whether they're coming with a religious or a philosophical or, or a psychological framework for what their interior life is. That idea of what is inward being turned outward, and then receiving what is outside of ourselves, whether it's other people or all of humanity, and figuring out how that influences our our inner lives. That's really when we're talking about spirituality, what, what we're offering in terms of um, a framework. And then the other thing I'd add is, you know, this is not done. I, I, I teach this, I'm a facilitator and a trainer, and I'm not done. You know, we don't, we don't ever finish on figuring out what our, our role is in the world and, and how we're leaning into our values and making choices that are, are making the world a better place. And really, as I see it, there are three core impact areas that, that still harbors reflection and discernment sessions have, and um, Jen and Jordan have alluded to them. And really, that's, that's about purpose or vision, sort of who am I in the world, what is my role, getting clear on that. Um, we sometimes call that bucket call, what is my calling. Um, the second area is about developing the capacity to take action in alignment with that purpose, to make decisions in alignment with the values that are embedded in the purpose. And then the third area is really about resiliency and reconciliation and healing. And sometimes that's within ourselves, sometimes that's in relationships, and sometimes that's on a, on a broader community or global level. What is, what is the understanding and reconciliation that's needed to pursue justice and equity and peace? Um, and so I think that's, that's, those are the three areas we're trying to have an impact with our programs. And certainly those aren't areas that one session is going to solve at all. They're really questions we ask our whole lives. That's great insight and feedback. Um, we have another question um, from DevEx. Uh, the question specifically is, how can youth without resources seek out mentors uh, to grow in leadership? Uh, I know that GHC CEO Barbara Bush actually talks about the importance of men mentors recently uh, in a Fortune Insider piece. So for those that might not have uh, a network around them or the resources to do one of the Still Harbor sessions, you know, what attributes should they look for? How can they identify um, a mentor and, uh, you know, what what is that process look like for them? Anyone want to take that? I can start. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think that, oh, sorry. I think that this is um, a really, really good question. Um, my first response would be that there are mentors everywhere in our lives, be them formalized or informal. I think that we're continually um, looking to people and, uh, and having them help shape kind of how we understand the world and ourselves and leadership. Um, and I think that role modeling is, is a big form of mentorship. And so when, I, when someone looks for a mentor, for me, something that's really important is kind of humility. Um, also someone who uses kind of a coaching style or learning through questioning and allows you to kind of assess things um, by asking the right, by them asking the right questions. Um, and then to embody kind of the leader that you want to be. I think leadership is sometimes hard to articulate, but it's very easy to see. It's very easy to understand on a visceral level. 
Um, so identify mentors in your community, people who are role models. It can be a teacher. Um, it can be someone who is in a community group you belong to. Um, and actively seek them out. I think everyone is unanimously flattered if someone would come to them and say, hey, I really respect you. You have qualities that I would like to learn from. And I think that's a really low-hanging fruit and a really easy way um, to help access mentorship. It takes a little bit of boldness um, to be willing to say that. But I think that um, there are mentors all around us, and it's a matter of, of looking for those attributes that emotionally appeal to you, but also intellectually embody kind of the leadership you want to be, and then proactively seeking that out. I don't know if Jen or Perry have anything to add. Sure. I can, I can just add that I totally agree that um, mentors are all around us. One of the activities that we do um, with Global Health Corps Fellows asks fellows to think about a hero. Think about somebody that's inspired you, and, and that can be you know, a big figure that you've read about, or that can be somebody that's very close to you. And when we talk about the people that inspire us, we begin to notice that there are a lot of people in our day-to-day -day that inspire us. And, and asking ourselves, what are, how are we engaging with those people that inspire us? What kind of questions are we asking them? How are we learning from them? And, um, you know, when you recognize that somebody is inspiring you, being able to say, thank you for sharing with me, thank you for, for that insight, and I'd like to hear more, just like Jordan said, is the best way to seek out mentorship. Um, and, and it may come from unlikely places. It may not be somebody who is a leader defined by um, an organization or by society. It may be somebody that just happens to be sharing their story with you or connecting with you on a different level. Um, and, and being able to engage in those relationships is important. All very, very good points. Um, we will leave a couple of extra minutes for people who are um, joining in with us to answer que or to ask some questions. Oh, actually, we just got one. Um, how do we get necessary attention to improve pre-hospital care in developing countries? Um, I'll turn that one over to either Jen or Jordan. Jordan, do you want to take that one on since you only have a little bit of battery power left? <laughs> yeah, the power is not on my side. Um, I actually, I'm a little unclear what we mean by kind of pre-hospital care. Um, is that kind of preventive care or um, kind of working through village health structures like village health workers? Um, I don't know, maybe Jen, you can elaborate if you understand the question a bit clearer. Um, I'm, I'm not super clear either, but what I, um, what I'm going to assume they're talking about is the prevention side of things, so as opposed to, um, treatment after someone gets sick, how do we, um, make sure that people are staying healthy so that they don't need to go to the hospital? At least that's my take on the question. Um, a lot of our fellows, uh, and then um, after the fellowship as well, work in health system strengthening. And that's looking at uh, the social determinants of health. That's looking at um, the way that the systems are set up now. And how do we improve those so that we are keeping people healthy? And understanding that while access to health care is essential and a human right, uh, we also don't want people to need to access that until it really um, is necessary. So people shouldn't be getting diseases that are easily preventable. And when they do get them, um, you know, they shouldn't be dying of diseases that are easily curable. And so, um, and so that's a huge part of a lot of the work that's being done. That happens, I think, on a Ministry of Health and on a government level, um, but also on a, on a systems level in the community. Um, community health workers, which is something that Jordan alluded to, um, is uh, an integral part of that we're seeing around the world um, as people who are monitoring the health of their communities and invested in keeping people healthy and recognizing when people need care and helping them get the care that they need. And that's, um, that's something that a lot of fellows are working on and it continues to be um, rolled out uh, across the world in really exciting ways. Um, Jordan, I can, I can pass that along back to you. 
Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think one of the most kind of innovative aspects of the Global Health Corps Fellowship is that it attracts people from a lot of different disciplines from the private sector. Not everybody has worked in health. They don't have a health background. And what that does is allow us to leverage a lot of really incredible talent for things like prevention. So, um, you know, I worked in communications, as I said, and that um, has a lot of implications for how we can do kind of um, education and using the best practices of branding and marketing to help do social marketing for health products or help engage in dialogue and behavioral change by kind of leveraging a lot of that communication and behavioral change theory that the private sector uses um, to improve health outcomes. And so I think that that um, has been, you know, a huge win in terms of preventative care and leveraging um, an interdisciplinary approach to making sure that people don't have to go to the hospitals in the first place. Um, when I was a Global Health Corps fellow, I worked on kind of a dialogue project for HIV prevention where we um, engaged in kind of a 12-step process of dialoguing or about everything from um, kind of you know, uh, love and whatever it may be, interdisciplinary approach to talk ultimately about how people can keep themselves healthy. Um, and so I think that um, it's, it's really important that kind of people understand the assets they have as leaders to help provide kind of preventative care and use their skills in a way that can um, ensure that we get the attention that's needed to keep people out of hospitals in the first place in developing countries. Great. So I think bringing, bringing all of this also back to leadership, we've talked about um, primarily one of the aspects of building, building leadership being spiritual and self-reflection and self-care um, from the perspective of both fellows and um, being part of this younger generation and then also uh, Perry in your experience working with a lot of emerging and developing leaders, what would each of you say are one to three of the most important components or key pieces of advice that you would give to um, young people who are looking to develop their leadership skills. Mary, do you want to take yeah. that one? Yeah, so um, I think I think that beyond this, this general idea of self-reflection, um, I think leadership that is transformative, that moves beyond the status quo, that really begins to uh, invite the positive disruption and the engagement that Jordan was, was speaking to. I think it has three qualities. One is imagination, um, two is courage, and three is really service or generosity or moving beyond the self, figuring out how to engage others. And so I think if we look at those three things, imagination, courage, and service, as leadership qualities, um, we have to ask ourselves, what does it take to imagine and take things outside of the box? What does it require to, uh, of myself to have courage? So, so courage and imagination are, are sort of these, these subtle qualities that, that sometimes we don't think we can teach. But when I, when I when I offer self-reflection, really what I'm trying to unlock is the possibility of imagination and courage. And then service, we, we teach a little bit more um, concretely in traditional ways, but, but when I think about service um, embedded in leadership, I think about not just service to the constituents or the community or the patient that we might be um, working with, but service to our colleagues, service to our staff, service as broadly defined as, um, what does it look what does it look like to define service as all of our choices and actions? So I guess, I guess those three qualities really stand out to me. Um, and, and I think getting to know yourself, getting to know your, your motivations and intentions go a long way to gaining the confidence to pursue leadership that has imagination, courage, and service as, as central components. Yeah, um, just just really quickly, um, some of the things that I, I think are important to think about when forming as a leader that 
every day you're you're practicing leadership. Leadership isn't standing on a podium, and and leadership isn't just when you get to the head of an institution, but it's it's a, a way of living and a way of being, and it's something that you should be intentionally practicing every day in order to cultivate those skills, and it's something that's iterative, and it's a process that you'll continue to do throughout your life. Um, and some of the things that you can practice every day are things like um, empathy and radical listening, like really recognizing uh, when you're being present with someone or when you're not being present with someone and, and reminding yourself to be, to really listen deeply. Um, openness and curiosity, sorry, there is an ambulance going by. Um, but openness and curiosity and, um, and recognizing times when you're saying no, 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 and instead being, being cognizant of that and saying, oh wait, I, you know, let, me, let me be open to this and think about it and hear what these other people are thinking and saying. And also, um, for as cheesy as this might sound to some people, but I think uh, loving kindness to, to yourself, to those around you, and to the world, and being intentional about those things and reminding yourself uh, to practice those things regularly are very formative practices in, in leadership. Thank you, John. Well, we have one more question, um, and this one I think is incredibly important now given how many uh, disruptive events are going on globally. Um, for those who work in development or who want to go into development, what are some ways to engage friends and family members who are not necessarily in the global health space or in development to under help them understand why it's important to um, somebody working in this field and how it can also be important to those people who are not necessarily working in the field. Any insight, Jordan? Yeah, um, thank you. And this is a really good question. I think it's, it's a really difficult question. Um, for me, it begins with first storytelling. I think people have a hard time relating to conceptual ideas about health equity, about, you know, revamping our primary health care system, um, but they have a very easy time relating to the story of an individual that you interacted with and the way that your work impacted that person. Um, so I think the first part is telling stories of individuals who embody the work that you do. Um, and I think the second aspect is um, to, you know, relate to something in their own life and their own experience. If someone has an experience what it's like to work in a developing country, in a place so far from their home, no matter the stories you tell or um, the you know anecdotes you have, they're going to still have a hard time relating. So bringing it to them and understanding kind of the space that they're operating from, um, and being able to relate the work you do in small ways to something that they understand or that they've experienced um, is is really important. Um, and then I think just being willing to ask questions and not get defensive. I think that there's so many issues facing the world, both domestically and internationally. And um, there is a need for people to be serving kind of those people in both places, um, in your home cities and in cities very far from your home. And so kind of being open to dialoguing about that and um, being kind of understanding and empathetic to that perspective, but still being able to um, explain to them kind of the value you're at adding and the way in which you're seeing kind of the work you do aligning with um, kind of greater social good. I don't know if Perry has something to add. Yeah, um, I, I just offer that your friends and family care about you. And so the more that you can say why you do the work that you do, how it makes you feel, how you connect to it, how it's changed you, the more that they'll be able to understand where you're coming from in the service, and sometimes that can open doors for them to want to explore on their own the issues or the, the specific interventions that you're working on or the community or people you're serving that they may feel more detached from. So I always recommend that if, you, if you're stuck with a family member or friend who just really doesn't seem to care about the things you care about, start with you. They care about you. How has your work transformed you? How has reading about the issues um, or taking leadership or taking on a job, how has it made you feel and how has it changed you and made your life richer? And sometimes we start there, we open up doors for other people to explore things that they wouldn't normally be receptive to. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Perry. Um, and I want to thank everyone who has tuned in today, um, and also Perry and Jordan, um, who have given a lot of wonderful insight and thoughts. Um, as we've all said, this is an iterative process, and maybe this is just the beginning for you. Maybe you've started to explore these things, and now you're ready to dig deeper. Um, but please continue, continue to think about these things. Ask the difficult questions. Ask why. Um, feel free to continue to tweet at GHC and at Still Harbor. DevX is leading this digital rally um, with the hashtag you will and talking about how you will lead tomorrow. Continue to engage with that um, as you're thinking about your own leadership um, and what you will do to lead tomorrow. Um, so thank you again for tuning in. And we, can, we are excited to continue to engage with you um, on your journey. Um, so thanks very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.